Well, welcome to our webinar on the Medicine Society and Culture Concentration for the Masters of Arts in Bioethics and Medical Humanities at Case Western Reserve. Uh, Dr. Jeanette, would you like to introduce what we're going to talk about today? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to hear about our program um, and to learn more about um, the Medicine Society and Culture Concentration. Um, I'm Dr. Leah Jeanette. I'm a senior research associate in the Department of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve University. And I work a lot with um, the incoming students and those who are interested in the program and the admissions process. So um, today for our webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about Case Western Reserve University, and then we'll go into the Medicine Society and Culture Concentration and the program overview. We'll talk about program outcomes, student life, student assistantships and financial aid, and the application process and deadline. And let me introduce our speakers today. So first we have Dr. Eileen Anderson Fye. She's the Director of Education for Bioethics and Medical Humanities and an Associate Professor of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve. We have Dr. Jonathan Sadowski, who's the Theodore J. Castile Professor of History and an Adjunct Professor of Bioethics. And we have Dr. Aaron Lamb, who's the Faculty Lead for the Humanities Pathway in the School of Medicine. And she's also a visiting associate professor of bioethics in the Department of Bioethics at Case. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Anderson Fai. Thank you so much. And I have to um, actually uh, celebrate that Dr. Lamb's position is probably changing as we speak. Um, she is no longer visiting. She is an associate professor of bioethics in the department. Um, and she is our Health Humanities faculty lead. So we are so delighted to have her on a permanent basis, um, beginning right now. So <laughs> next webinar, our, our titles on this slide will change. So congratulations, Dr. Lamb. It's an honor and privilege to have you as part of our program permanently. Thank you. It is entirely my privilege. I am delighted. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. Thank you again for joining us. I do want to add that we have the chat feature going. I'm going to try and move us through at a pretty good pace so that you can kind of focus in. If you have questions on one area of the program or another or about application or something in the program or content um, or anything else. So we're going to give you some kind of 10,000 foot general information but you can totally feel free to write in questions on the chat and this is not your only chance to ask questions you can contact any of us after the webinar as well so Case Western Reserve University is an amazing place to be um, at any time and definitely we've learned also during a pandemic um, in terms of its academics, it has some of the, the highest ranked programs and in areas related um, to bioethics, medical humanities, and social medicine. So social work, healthcare law, nursing, um, business, and particularly in the healthcare um, business area. Um, obviously, our medical school is very highly ranked in lots of different areas, um, and we work together with programs across the university. The, our Department of Bioethics and our Program of Bioethics and Medical Humanities is situated within the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve. But we have collaborations, as you'll hear in a little bit, not only with all the other seven schools that comprise the university, but also the four major hospital systems in the area, the vast majority of museums, arts and cultural um, organizations in the area, which are plenty, um, many um, and neighborhood associations, etc. Um, so, one of the questions um, we get, and, and actually I want to make one more preamble comment 
which is that this is a really special year for this master's program. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more and, and about the profile of our graduates and where they've gone on. But 2020, in addition to all of its challenges, bringing us a major celebration. It is the 25th anniversary of our MA program, making it uh, one of the oldest in the nation and the best established. So we are doing a variety of activities to celebrate this really important anniversary throughout the year. And when we get to telling you a little bit more about our alumni um, and current graduating students, et cetera, um, you'll, you'll get a little bit of a feel for what a special year this is if you're considering to come in the program in the next year. So one of the first things we should talk about are you know, what are the medical humanities, sometimes also called health humanities, and social medicine? Um, and why do these matter? So I, I actually would like to begin by turning it over to my amazing colleagues, um, we are very, very lucky. We, we all work together in this program. Um, by training, I'm a medical psychological anthropologist. Um, Dr. Sadowski is a medical historian. Um, Dr. Lamb is a medical humanist and with a, with a doctorate in literature. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Sadowski and Dr. Lamb if you would speak a little bit to this critically important question. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in and, and go first. Um, so, you know, this question, what are medical humanities? Um, it's, it's a huge question because it's a really big and diverse field. So when we talk about medical humanities and social medicine, it is a giant umbrella that includes all sorts of, of disciplines within it. So a wide range of humanities, uh, the fine arts, and qualitative social sciences. So what, you know, given that it's so large, what tends to actually unite this into something that is a coherent field um, is that all of the approaches are, are focused on a critical perspective on health, right? And so in very much the humanity style, um, there's this tendency to ask really difficult questions that don't have simple answers um, and to, to work through those uncomfortable, messy sorts of, of answers that we get. Um, I'll say it's also united by a focus on social justice. And if you have been paying attention to the world right now, um, I think it's pretty obvious that there is a real need for critical perspectives. Um, so just to mention a few of the things that medical humanists have been very uh, concerned about and interested in recently, um, I'd say there's a focus on things like analyzing the varied reasons that so many black and brown old and disabled populations have been disproportionately affected by COVID um, and figuring out new strategies to address those inequities um, or explaining why so many American citizens refuse to wear a mask and seem to be blatantly ignoring scientific advice and figuring out more successful ways for public health communication. Um, Another thing might be coming up with specific strategies to take the momentum uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement and create some critical reform that can address all the health disparities in Black lives. Um, there are also people who are envisioning creative ways to document people's diverse experiences of the pandemic that can serve as a tool for understanding and learning from this experience as we move forward. And, and those are just a few. But whatever particular interests or, or disciplinary backgrounds that you might want to bring into the work that you do in this program, we have an extended network of faculty that can help you develop the kinds of inquiry and projects that you're most invested in. Um, rather like the humanities, you know, we appreciate the fact that no student is just like another. And we're committed to giving you individualized support and creating an environment that will allow um, all of you to flourish in the ways that matter most to you. So I'll leave it at that and turn things over to Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, one thing that I really like to emphasize. Hey, Jonathan, you're echoing uh, quite a bit. So is there a way to turn down the echo, even though it's a little bit otherworldly? 
I don't know. Does that? I don't know what's causing the echo. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. That that was a new new one for us with Jonathan. Are you still there, Jonathan? Okay, um, I, until Jonathan joins back up, he is having some kind of internet difficulty. Um, I'm gonna jump in for a second and first say, thank you, Dr. Lamb. I think you really, um, you know, gave an overview of the kinds of, um, you know, wide reaching topics um, that medical humanities and social Covers. And I do think that our current situation is such a good one for understanding um, why, why the non-biological pieces of medicine matter. So obviously, we've got a lot in our current pandemic, um, ventilators matter, matter um, and but so do so many other things, like having enough hospital beds. Who does, who doesn't? Why do some states and regions have different public health outcomes than others? We know it's incredibly uneven. And I would say those kinds of inequalities um, are, are very much what this realm of study aims to deal with. So you had named social justice, absolutely. And we look at that from multiple perspectives. We look at historical perspectives. We look at intracultural differences. We look at intersectional um, Eileen, I think we're also losing you as you speak. Are you still there, Eileen? To all our attendees, I'll just say, um, you know, if you have been, <laughs> if you have been in education this last year or working, chances are that you have been on many, many Zoom calls like this where um, it just doesn't quite work out. So sorry about all these technical difficulties and thank you for bearing with us. Erin, while we wait, um, is there anything else you wanted to say about medical humanities and social medicine? Sure. You know, I'll say one of the things that I think, uh, one of the most cool things that I've seen a lot of medical humanities people doing right now is trying to come up with different creative ways to help us envision what our world might look like moving forward. I mean, what we've been experiencing these past few months is well, it's not entirely unprecedented, and, and Dr. Sadowski could certainly tell you that we've had, um, you know, far more extensive pandemics in, in history. Um, but certainly, I think for all of us in our living history, um, it's an unprecedented moment, and it's an opportunity to think about how we might want our world to work differently. Um, and so, you know, people are invested in in helping everybody come up with with creative ways to see different visions of what's possible so that we might be able to take advantage of it. Um, and I think that's the most exciting stuff that was going on. Um, I believe we have Dr. Sadowski back with us and hopefully um, without the echo. So I will turn things over to Dr. Sadowski. Yes, thanks. Uh, am I echoing? I... You are not echoing, it sounds great. Okay, great, thanks. So I, I missed a few minutes and I don't know what I missed. So uh, I may I hope I don't go over anything that's been said already, but. One thing that um, I like to stress is that our program is um, distinctive. It's really unusual. And one of the ways that it's unusual is this. Over the last few years, many medical humanities programs have sprouted up, not just in this country, but in Europe, in Africa, and to the best of my knowledge, probably in other places as well. I'm just 
talking about the ones I've known about. Um, and there are also uh, social medicine programs, places that are dedicated to the social science study of medicine. There are very few um, programs that really try to combine them the way we do. And, um, and I think that's important because um, we are committed to the idea that you can't really understand any of health, illness, healing, and related topics um, from only a humanistic or only a social scientific perspective. They all informed one another. And for example, um, one subject that's um, very well developed in medical humanities is the idea of narrative medicine, the rendering of stories. Um, but what, where do stories come from? What is the social position of the storyteller? And what are the cultural expectations of what a story looks like? Those are questions that are, um, that are asked by the social sciences. So that's one of the reasons we think it's so, just an example of why we think it's so important to combine. Thank you so much, um, Drs. Lamb, Sadowski, and Jeanette for um, keeping us going there. In all of my Zooms this spring, that is the first time I've had whatever audio problem I just had. Um, Dr. Jeanette, would you be willing to run the slides just in case I have a glitch again? Sure, no problem. All right, so I'm gonna shorthand, since we had that little bump, to say if anyone has questions um, about these fields, we're really happy um, to help answer them or tell you, you know, we want students to have a good fit in their program. And so we're happy to talk with you if your interests, you know, are something that really fits within this. What I will say um, that I, I haven't heard yet, and, and to echo Dr. Sadowski, I'm sorry if it was said while I was out, is that um, the, the bringing together, the, the degree that we have is bioethics and medical humanities. And the reason why is that any issue in the medical humanities, medical social sciences, medical arts has ethical issue at its core. And any issue in bioethics or medical ethics, healthcare ethics, um, has these social, cultural, contextual, representative, narrative um, kinds of issues at its heart and soul. And so the fusion of, of these fields centering on identifying what values are at stakes at these different levels where decisions are made. So that could be the individual clinical level people leave our program and go on into clinical ethics. It could be at the larger policy level, how to make policies um, to improve health for all populations, certain subpopulations. All of those things hinge on um, these kind of social contextual um, factors. So a lot of people will ask, um, and you know, again, as really seen in our, our world right now, these questions are the, at the very heart of human health and healthcare. Um, so a lot of people will ask how a degree in this field helps your career path. Um, we, the way that we think about that at Case Western Reserve is we really love to bring in a class where students have all different kinds of backgrounds and we bring them together for an intensive year or if you do the program full time, an, an intensive nine month program and then people go out into all different areas um, and one of the reasons why that's so valuable in the field of health is that these big questions about health really need multiple perspectives. So in any given master's class, 
we have students, for example, who are going on to, um, they're pre-med and they're going on to medical and other clinical professions. Some of them have been very, very heavily science focused and have taken very few classes in um, social an analysis or writing or argumentation or ethics or these sorts of things. Some of them have undergraduate degrees in social sciences, humanities, or arts. Um, some are doing joint programs um, with, say, the law school, simultaneously getting a JD or an MD or a nursing degree or genetic counseling degree. Um, we really want to um, take these big questions um, of, you know, take an issue like a pandemic um, and bring together people who are looking at that from ethical points of view, from historical points of view, from social justice points of view, from uh, legal points of view, healthcare administration, research administration, um, and on and on to kind of understand the full 360 picture that our biggest questions and challenges in health and healing and illness and birth and death and all these important topics um, bring together and that we have to have some understanding of no matter which piece of the pie we want to dig in and study and work with for our career. So we have had students go on into many clinical professions, nursing, MD, DO, um, anesthesia assistants, PAs, uh, naturopaths, all kinds of different clinical professions. And one of the things students really love about our program is that through, we're going to talk about the importance of the clinical internships that we offer, and through some of the career development and other exposure that happens, students learn about career paths related to health and healthcare that they may have not even knew existed before they come into the program. So a lot of students do use this year for discernment about what do I want my specialty to be in any of these fields we've mentioned, um, whether it's, you know, splitting hairs over do I want to do a PhD in anthropology or sociology, or do I want my medical specialty to be OBGYN or um, burn medicine, whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, or really learn about new kinds of career opportunities. Our students go on to a huge array of careers throughout the healthcare world. Can we go ahead and advance? Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, it is our 25th anniversary, um, which brings um, opportunities. You know, we don't know exactly what they're going to look like in the fall when we have our alumni reunion weekend. We definitely are going to have um, virtual uh, alumni panels, celebrations, career networking, um, professional development opportunities, and hopefully we'll have some in person as well if that's safe enough. So our program is um, an intensive one-year program of 30 credit hours. There are require things that are required for everyone, which we'll give you a little visual of, and you can take significant electives to work with your advisor one-on-one -on -one to make sure that you are getting what you need for your particular pathway through the program. That is also something we can talk with you about as you're considering applying or attending the program. All of our students do 80 hours each semester of clinical ethics rotations in one of four major hospital systems. This is always a highlight for our students. And in a few minutes, I'll ask Dr. Jeanette just to, to talk about those a little bit since she is the coordinator of that amazing program. We have a number of short-term study abroad immersion courses that students absolutely love as well. 
We don't know what those are completely going to look like in the coming year. For winter, um, we have actually transitioned some of our immersion courses um, into Zoom courses. So we have one on poetry with an incredibly accomplished poet. Um, so poetry and health, healing, suffering, illness, etc. And we, we actually have an intensive looking at pandemics from um, multiple major perspectives. Um, in the spring and in May of 2021, we are still hoping to offer some of our amazing study abroad courses, which we'll show you um, in a few slides. Our program, because it is designed to support a diversity of trajectories, each student is assigned an advisor um, who has similar interests that you will work with to make sure that you plan your course of study as well as possible um, to, ac to accomplish your goals in this program. You are also welcome to talk to any of the four of us throughout the year um, if, if one of us is not your advisor for additional brainstorming and advising. This is something we take really seriously and can happen one-on-one -on -one in small groups. This summer, we are actually gathering together some of our recent alums and admitted students to learn from, so our admitted students can learn from their perspectives and experience and start to network. Um, also very unusual for a master's program, we offer competitive student ass assistantships, which are awarded on a um, kind of a hybrid of need and merit, where as a master's student, you might have the opportunity to serve as a teaching assistant in an undergraduate course, as a research assistant, and I and many of my colleagues have published with our master students, so people are coming out with publications, um, or as a program assistant. Um, these, our priority deadline for these were June 1st. Um, so if this is something you're interested in, time is of the essence. Um, but we do offer, even if you are not awarded one of these positions, there are other kinds of assistantships that you might be able to step into. Some would be um, volunteer or if people have other kinds of grant funded opportunities, you could be hired into those as well. Let's go ahead. In the Medicine Society and Culture Concentration and um, Actually, this picture makes me smile because these are some of our students from our first year who have gone on to amazing careers. Um, there's a PhD, a, a bioethics PhD, and an MD right there um, who are in our initial um, cohort. So this is our deep dive into medical humanities and social medicine. So one of your electives in the fall is a required Foundations of Medicine, Society, and Culture core course that for this coming year, Dr. Sadowski and I will co-teach. Um, and this course goes through some of the major themes um, in medical humanities and social medicine, many of which have already been brought up. Themes like um, race and racial justice in healthcare, narrative, testimony, stigma, and this is in no order, but, but these are the types of themes where you're reading literature, you're, you may be reading poetry, you're reading social science, you're reading um, other types of uh, humanistic inquiry. And we help scaffold you, regardless of your background and experience, to be able to engage these different types of literatures and to write a short, concise, compelling, creative, analytic argument. So over the years, we've heard a lot of wonderful things about this, the value of this course in our students' futures, no matter what they are. Um, we also have a Medicine Society and Culture Seminar where you, are, you have a lot of say over events 
not only in our department or in the medical school, but all over the university and university circle. And, and interestingly, in our pandemic world, many of our students were able to participate in seminars um, not only from coast to coast, but also internationally. So some of our close colleagues um, at Harvard Center for Bioethics um, did a really wonderful short series this spring that our students were able to zoom into. Um, we, we work very closely with places like the Dittrich Center for Medical History, which is one of the best medical history museums in the world that is on our campus. And they host some wonderful um, speakers every year, and we are actually collaborating with them to co-host in the coming year. So the seminar is designed to give you wide exposure, um, kind of with, with you driving the choices um, toward areas you have of interest that um, with a, you know very simple pre-approval we, we will give you opportunities but you can also find opportunities in your area of interest that will count toward that. There are many electives in our department and around the university that are related to these topics um, and Everyone will do the clinical work rotations in the fall. The majority of people will continue clinical ro rotations in the spring, but some of our students are better served by some other kind of medicine, society, and culture practicum. So for example, we have had students who are going on to do a PhD in various fields who wanted to work on a research project in the spring for their practicum where their final product would be a publishable paper. We have had um, social justice oriented students who have worked at the Cleveland Department of Public Health or in our free clinic, um, which the, our medical students do the lion's share of the work uh, with or in other um, federally qualified health uh, centers that we have close relationships with in our department. So again, this is something where you would talk with your advisor and you would talk with us to kind of come up with which of these opportunities and experiences is going to give you what you need to best achieve the next step in your education or career. All right, let's keep going. And we are actually going to say goodbye to Dr. Sadowski right now, though he will be available later. Um, he was uh, double booked and was kind enough to jump in with us um, for the beginning of this webinar. So um, we also offer our traditional program, again, that has been running. We modify it. We, we take seriously the feedback of our alumni and the changing composition of our faculty and of contemporary um, science and situations. So we're constantly improving the program. But at the core, um, it has been running now for, again, 25 years. So our traditional program you would do, um, that is without a concentration, which is not required. And I should say about half the students every year do do the medical, medicine, society, and culture concentration. Um, so in, a, in an average class of around 55, 60 students, about half will um, opt into the seminar, which, which is actually, or into the um, concentration, which has provided a really nice opportunity for community building as well. But that happens in the traditional program and within our other concentration research ethics. So in the traditional program, all students do clinical rotations both semesters. And again, you know, depending on your interests and goals, you work with your advisor to pick your electives to best meet those. Um, and you have more elective room because you are not required to have the, the fall um, and year-long seminars. In the research ethics concentration, it is analogous to medicine, society, and culture in terms of its requirements, except that it's really focused on research ethics. Um, and students who graduate from that, some of them go on to be research scientists, some of them go on to 
um, do jobs like running an IRB or helping with um, research, you know, oversight and regulation. We just had a reunion for one of our classes um, from a couple years ago, and it was really exciting to hear about one of our students who did this concentration who went into compliance um, in at the University of Florida system and is making a difference every day already, you know, just uh, not even two years out yet. Um, so it is possible to do both concentrations and every year just a couple of people will do that, though it would definitely restrict your electives, but for a, a handful of people every year, that's the right choice. So this is what um, the concentrations in the traditional programs, it's just a little visual so you can see what, the, um, what your semester would look like. Every student in the program takes Foundations of Bioethics 1 and 2. 2 is in the spring. So this is the fall semester. This is a six credit course that we have actually just redesigned to be prepared for dual delivery and also taking seriously the feedback that we've gotten um, from the past you know, five years worth of students, now alumni. Um, so in this course, you are going through all of the major issues, themes, and approaches to studying bioethics and, and medical humanities. Um, so this is a shared experience that we want everyone to have. This is issues from conception and birth, you know, throughout the life cycle to death and dying. Um, it also covers contemporary topics about public health ethics. Um, and we actually have been covering issues like pandemics um, every year, although it, given the obvious increased interest, we are, we are adding a little bit more on that next year. But it also includes things like stem cell research. Um, nine and things like global health ethics. Um, so that course is really a core. And then we've, we've spoken enough about the rest that I'm going to leave it there, but you're always welcome to ask more questions. In the spring semester, it's analogous, except that you are also doing a capstone. So each student will complete a written capstone that is most typically a critical literature review in an area that you want to become an expert in. And you will work not only with our primary faculty in our department, but oftentimes our secondary faculty who may be embedded in a hospital or embedded um, in another department around the university to really become um, an expert. So I, an actual, um, I, an example just popped into my mind because recently I've worked with two students on related issues of, um, the, each of them was looking at racial disparities in neuroethics and in transplant ethics. Um, and so in this case, we brought on, um, you know, a small team, an expert in neuroethics at the Cleveland Clinic, um, an ex expert in transplant ethics um, at the Cleveland Clinic, also, um, and Metro Health, um, and social scientists who had some expertise in social justice and health disparities um, to really investigate that topic. One of those students who graduated two years ago is now going on to do a PhD focusing in that area, but honed the clarity and expertise in her capstone to be able to go on for future study. So it's a wonderful opportunity to work closely with, with usually one faculty member, but occasionally a small team to dive in um, and, and really work on a topic near and dear to your heart. So um, Dr. Jeanette, why don't you talk a little bit about the amazing clinical ethics rotations since you're the course director? Sure. So Cleveland is a really great city in that we have four major teaching hospitals um, available for students to um, rotate at. So as you can see on the slide, we have Cleveland Clinic, 
um, and which is probably the most well known if you're not from Cleveland. Um, but we also have uh, the Veterans Hospital. This is the fourth largest VA in the country. Uh, we have Metro Health System, which is uh, the county hospital, and it really focuses on serving the underinsured and the uninsured. And then uh, there's University Hospitals of Cleveland, which is actually somewhat embedded within Case's campus. Um, during these rotations, as was referenced before, you're going to be doing 80 hours per semester. And it can range from being at morning rounds or interdisciplinary team meetings to going one-on-one -on -one with a clinician or some type of healthcare professional, including social workers, chaplains, genetic counselors, um, and then the opportunity to attend various meetings. So ethics committees, um, rehab meetings, animal research meetings. Um, the, the, really the goal of this course is to focus on students' ability to identify ethical issues in the clinical setting. So while you're going to some of these meetings and some of these rounds, you may not explicitly hear someone say, well, this ethical issue is X, Y, Z in this case. They might describe the medicine and the social issues and the economic issues with this patient, but it's your job as the bioethics students to understand and to identify those ethical issues. And then the students get together uh, weekly with a preceptor to talk about their experiences as well as right up to case analyses um, during the semester. Thank you, Dr. Jeanette. And I will say, um, Dr. Jeanette and colleagues have done an extraordinary job when with no notice, we had to turn those amazing experiences into virtual clinical rotations. In that case, we were really lucky that most of our students had already been in their hospital settings, um, in the hospital, seeing life day in, day out, and death, and suffering, and healing, and miracles, and all of these things. Um, for next year, uh, you, you, know, you may have questions about what is it going to look like. We have contingency plans for just about everything. So we're ready to go um, in the hospitals when we get the safety clearance, which we will only do when it is allowed and we have proper precautions. Um, we have hybrid options. Uh, ready to go. We do know how to do the virtual options now. Even some of our, I was just speaking with some of our alum who are doing their clerkships in medical school and they are having to do virtual clerkships and things like surgery. It's just an unprecedented time um, in our educational system. But as Dr. Jeanette said, because we have these amazing hospital systems with whom we've collaborated for 25 plus years, um, we have been working very well together to try and come up with the very best options for our students possible. It may also be, um, we've spoken with a couple of international students who were concerned that they might not be able to come to campus until later, in which case we're prepared to do different sorts of in intensives and timings to accommodate um, you know, whatever next year might bring. So we've got a lot of individualization and contingency plans so that people feel safe and are practicing um, best guidelines regardless of what comes down um, from uh, governments, from hospitals, and from our university who has a, an extraordinary team um, making these decisions. So you're welcome to talk to us about your individual situation if you have concerns about that as well. Um, these study abroad um, courses, not all of which are abroad, we've been offering one in Yellowstone National Park. Um, the, I, even though we have brought in um, some extraordinary Native American um, instructors into that program as well. The, um, the program is taking place uh, within the United States. Um, but we, you can see the kind of range of places and programs. This is what is anticipated to be offered next year. We have other classes in other parts of the world um, that we are holding off due to the pandemic um, and uncertainties, but we are evaluating right now. As I said, we've already transitioned our winter break programs um, to be 
uh, online intensives or hybrid on our campus intensives. Um, but we are now evaluating our spring 2021 programs, which would usually include Paris, uh, the Netherlands, and Costa Rica. And we are also looking at our May term courses, which would be a different course in the Netherlands, Granada, um, Yellowstone, um, and we're, we're weighing some other options. So we'd be happy to talk more about these courses. Um, our students describe them as life-changing. It's one thing to learn about what healthcare and public health um, look like in another country. It's another thing to immerse yourself and experience it. Um, and we actually have a growing area of expertise in the department in environmental ethics and human health. And the Yellowstone collaboration has grown out of that program. So we actually were Yellowstone National Park's very first class ever um, specializing in environmental ethics and human health instead of an ecological focus. Oh, and those count as one electives one elective. So those are three credit courses. Um, so we offer multiple dual degree options. You can see them there. Um, I do want to note that you would need to apply to each of the programs individually to be accepted to a dual degree. The, um, and some of our students will do, they arrive on our campus and then realize wow, I really want to do a dual degree. That is, with, with many of the options, that is possible to do to kind of apply in the fall for, say, a January um, start. Uh, so we can talk to you if you have an interest or develop an interest in that, or maybe some of you have already applied to another program. The benefit, by the way, is usually a savings um, in money, and in being able to double count a limited number of credits. So it actually accelerates your accomplishment of both degrees. So we're not gonna go over this slide. I just want you to see the kinds of outcomes that, um, that our students have. They go on to advanced study all over the country and the world um, to some of the best um, places, you know, they possibly could for medical school, for um, law school, for uh, social work, for doctorates in an entire array of fields. It's, um, we have an incredibly wonderful track record of our students going from our program and accomplishing their educational and career goals. You can see the kind of range, and this is by no means a limited range of what our students go on to do, um, but it's a huge range. We also have incredible student life where we are. Um, we mentioned how awesome Cleveland is for the relationship with the hospitals. Um, it, we also just have an incredible um, student life on the campus as a graduate student in our department you get access to what is in our department um, for students, what is in the School of Medicine, so you're, you get an opportunity to meet students across the school, and what is in the entire university as well as university circle. We have, as you probably know, lots of major sports teams, lots of amazing museums within walking distance, world-class museums. The, thank you, Dr. Jeanette, the second largest theater district in the United States, number one being New York City. We have a national park not far from campus. We have a ring of um, metro parks, which last year were named best in the United States. Um, you know, it's just, we have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, very inexpensive access to, to all of these things. Um, so our students, they work, you know, as the cliche goes, they, they also play hard. And we're just really fortunate. You know, students are coming in from all over the country, all over the world. So there tends to be a lot of bonding. Students um, bond together and, you know, make up an intramural sports team 
or you know we've had students come up with cooking clubs or eating clubs or um, you know go out on all these outings together uh, so there's really an enormous amount even within walking distance let alone public transportation it's it's an incredible quality of life the, the cost of living is also very low con compared to any other city with this kind of amenity in it. Um, we get a lot of questions about financial aid. I've talked about the competitive student assistantships, and we also expect everyone who is applying for financial aid to fill out a FAFSA, and you do have the different kinds of um, financial aid options that are typically available, as well as work-study options um, on the campus, and we can direct you to people in those offices if you would like some more help. So, Dr. Janak, can you talk a little bit about the application process since you are um, heavily involved? Sure, absolutely. So, um, when students want to apply for our program, we're looking for um, exactly what you see on this screen. So, transcripts from all undergrad and grad programs. Um, they can be unofficial, um, and then once you're accepted, uh, you can submit your official transcripts afterwards. Um, in your personal essay, we really want to see how this program fits into your career path and why the interest in bioethics and medical humanities. Um, and the same thing is true, you know, reflected on the CV resume and the letters of recommendations, including one from a faculty. Um, we've made our standardized tests optional this year. We know because of uh, COVID and the pandemic that a lot of standardized graduate level tests have been canceled or rescheduled. And so we didn't want that to be a barrier to students applying to our program. And we've also waived the application fee for the remainder of this current cycle. Um, once you submit your completed application, um, it'll be reviewed by an admissions committee member within our department. And you will also be interviewed by someone from that committee, either via telephone or Zoom. Um, it's not meant to be a high pressure interview, but it's a way, again, for us to get to know you a little bit and to really understand why your interest is in bioethics and medical humanities and how this fits into your career path. And just to kind of continue on that, um, our final deadline um, for fall 2020 is August 1st. So while there is some time, we recommend getting those applications in as soon as you can. So we have time to review, um, and then you also have time to make decisions. Um, we're also looking forward to our orientation on August 21st. Uh, we're still not entirely sure what that's going to look like, given that um, we have to do things, what we're calling dual delivery, so this hybrid model of in-person and online, um, but more information will be made available about that as well. Dr. Jeanette, thank you so much, and we have some excellent questions, so I'm going to go ahead and um, answer them. Um, one of the questions is, does the bioethics program at Case Western Reserve utilize any of the resources available at the new health education campus. So for those who don't know, the health education campus is a 300 million plus brand new campus, um, an interprofessional campus that was um, recently finished. It's a collaboration between the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve. And the answer to do our students utilize the health education campus is a resounding yes. We have a shuttle stop right outside our offices. Um, however, let me give you a, um, a little caveat, which is that our health education campus was actually within a, a few weeks um, transformed into a thousand bed COVID-19 hospital in case it was needed. Not one person um, has actually um, been hospitalized there because Ohio and Northeast Ohio did such an extraordinary job with pandemic control. But let me put it this way, to the extent that anyone is utilizing the health education campus, we absolutely are. The, the way that, those are not our home base offices, though several of our faculty are based over at the health education campus, but our students are over at that campus on a regular basis for trainings, for lectures, um, for various professional opportunities. A lot of our students want to go and um, experiment and see the HoloLens 
uh, which was piloted at Case Western Reserve, things like that. So if you have additional um, specific questions about the health education campus, I'm happy to answer them. But, but the answer is yes, we are part of that campus, although um, that, that is not the main spot um, for our classroom space, for example. Another great question um, is what kinds of resources are available for out-of-state students? Um, so the vast majority of our students are coming in from out-of-state. Um, we have a student life coordinator um, who is Maureen Norris, who is actually on vacation right now, or she may have joined us today. Um, and she and Dr. Jeanette um, and others are always kind of helping out-of-state students to relocate. We have um, quite a number of admitted students already who have joined together on a Facebook group, um, and we have password-protected pages on our website for admitted students where people have joined together to look at housing together. We're lucky to have kind of houses and apartments that are kind of passed on year to year from one cohort of students to the next. Um, so in terms of how to get your bearings, how to figure out where to live, that those kinds of questions, we've got a lot of experience with that and helping to find you find, you know, help you find something within your price range, within your priorities. Um, the university also has a lot of those services to help you relocate. Um, I don't think I mentioned earlier, but I should. The university has also been extraordinary in providing services. Um, you know, we, we always have, but they have really stepped up in this pandemic, in this moment um, where there is a heightened um, awareness of the need to um, take action for uh, racial justice and other types of um, of justice and student health and well-being, those resources are also available to you as you transition. So um, you can let us know, you know, what you're looking for. But yes, there are. It's it's an extraordinary place for student resources, which is one of the reasons why we we have been running um, for so long and with such a strong booming program. Um, all right, another great question. For people who are working full time but are interested in this program, is the program still doable? The answer is yes. A lot of our students will come in and just dig into the program without um, that situation, but, but a number of students every year are working full time in various types of careers and um, excel in completing the program. We, we accommodate for that in various ways. So our required courses, such as the foundations courses, this year you are actually going to have more flexibility than we have in prior years. Um, this year, um, you, there will be some lectures that you will actually access on your own time um, before that course happens, but the required times for that course are kind of after traditional working hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we can work with you to shape your schedule if you are working full time. So we've had, you know, students in different kinds of jobs. We've had, you know, students who are clinical providers want to come back and do the program full time. We have had um, students working, you know, various types of research jobs or other kind of uh, traditional nine to five jobs who want to come back and do the program full time. Um, and we have had students who have flexible types of jobs. So whatever it is, um, we can work with you on um, what you need for your schedule. And, and the other reason we've kind of set it up that way is so that our dual degree students um, can attend whatever they need. All right, do we, do we have any other open questions? Dr. Anderson, I have one final question for you um, to, to answer. So what sets Case Western Reserve apart from other MA programs of similar um, focus? 
Oh, that is a great question, Dr. Jeanette. Um, so I'm asked this question all the time, um, and and my answer to it is is exactly why I have chosen a career at Case Western Reserve. Um, in so many ways, what is offered in this program is truly unparalleled. So earlier, Dr. Sadowski mentioned um, the bench strength that is not only in one tiny little area, but it's across all of them, that we have an interdisciplinary faculty with expertise across um, bioethics and ethical specializations, across humanities, across social sciences, and increasingly, actually, um, next year, uh, across the arts. Um, so that kind of collaborative work is very, very hard to find um, nationally. Um, e even at, you know, other highly ranked programs. One of the other things that's so, well, there's so many things, but another very special thing about our department and about this program is that all of our research um, or all of our faculty have a dual focus. All of them, all of us have um, a very research active profiles. We all have major grants. We all are working on major national and international um, projects. And yet, every single faculty member cares deeply about students. That is how we were able to develop this um, close advising system and uh, capstone system, mentoring system. Um, it is actually one of the ways that we have hired faculty over the decades. Our faculty have to not only be the best in what they do, they also have to care passionately about students and about education. And that dual focus you don't always um, find. You know, the, the clinical rotations are incredibly unique um, nationally. Um, as well as the kind of um, personalization and study abroad. So the, the holistic nature of this program, as well as the alumni community you join. You know, we have over 700 graduates of this program who care about you when you graduate from this program or when you're a student in this program. So actually this year as part of our anniversary ceremonies, we are launching different kinds of mentorship um, relationships between our alumni and current students or, re or older alumni and, and more recent alumni that you, you know, it's a, it's a one year intensive program, but this is a program where people become part of this family. And it's, it's just been so amazing to me, um, it, you know, as a faculty member who's been there now um, going on five years um, because I came from another program um, to see the kind of connection and kind of lifelong um, resource and community that this program generates. And I think it's because of the excellence and the dedication and the community feel um, that people come uh, out with when you leave Case Western Reserve with this degree, the world knows what this degree is. It is second to none. And that is why our students go on to such incredible futures. So again, um, we've reached the end of our webinar, but I really want to invite you to um, contact bioethics at case.edu. Um, and if Dr. Jeanette cannot answer your question, um, she will connect you with the person who can, or maybe you'll end up speaking to a couple of us. Um, and if you are considering applying for this program, we have actually waived the application fee for the rest of this cycle, given um, the pressures of the pandemic. And, you know, we understand that for, for most people, um, every dollar matters. Um, I would urge you to um, apply as soon as possible. 
uh, because the program will fill. Um, and also, if you have any interest in being um, considered for the assistantships, you know, those are, we have passed the priority deadline and those are first come, first serve. So I'd really um, urge you to kind of work on that application right away. I should say for this year, given the challenges of the pandemic, we have also waived the standardized test requirement. Um, or re-emphasize that. Um, so if you've already taken one, um, you can go ahead and submit it, but you don't have to. Um, in, our, in the personal statement, we get a lot of questions coming back on, you know, that's not an exceptionally long statement, but what we want to know is that this is a fit for you, that there's a reason this program is the right fit for you, um, and that we can know that you're gonna get what you wanna get out of it going forward in your career. Do you have anything else to add, Dr. Jeanette? No, I just wanna um, thank all of the folks that have attended the, the webinar today. Thank you for um, hanging in there as we had some audio uh, difficulties. Um, but I just wanna reemphasize, please reach out to us with any questions you have um, bioethics at case.edu is the quickest way to get a hold of us and either I will respond or someone else in the department um, will respond. So um, we hope you consider applying and we hope ultimately that we see you in the fall. Thank you so much for joining us today and Dr. Jeanette, thank you for hosting. All right, have a good day everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.